Hello, and welcome to By the Numbers, a new series where we're going to look at Dungeons & Dragons New Edition in 2024. We'll deep dive into each of the classes, see how much damage, control, durability, and mental resistance they have. We'll look at all of their features and see what exactly they bring to the table numerically. Today, I'm really excited to bring to you the Rogue. This is something that I've looked forward to for a while. I speculated that Rogue would be the weakest class in 2024 a while back. Now I'm here to see if that is correct or not. I'll go through all the Rogue's features, talk about the impact they bring to the table. I'll also create a stereotypical Rogue build and see how that will perform in 2024. I'll put that into our tier list and see where it lands in terms of all of those aspects we were talking about. The Rogue is the skill monkey of D&D. Out of combat, they are able to pick locks, sneak past guards, undo traps, and all the shenanigans that they are known to do. Inside combat, their sneak attack ability is their main way of dealing damage. Rogues in 2014 have a bad reputation for their damage scaling and getting lower and lower and lower as levels go on. This can be mitigated by either finding a consistent way to generate advantage, or to add in additional attacks so we can get sneak attack off more often. But if you can't do either of those, then yes, your damage is going to get quite low at later tiers. I know a lot of people were hoping that sneak attack damage would be boosted, but let's take a look at what things we did get and see overall if it ended up helping. As we begin, we're going to talk about damage, and often damage is done in damage per round. And while that is useful, I find it very hard to understand what it actually means. So I've invented a term called combat space. Essentially what this means is taking that DPR over four rounds of combat, what percentage of a deadly encounter you can take out by yourself with that DPR. So 15 damage per round might turn into 30% of a deadly encounter. Of course, as we level up, that 15 damage per round will do less and less impact on the deadly encounter because monster HP is ever increasing. I wanted to explain this early because right now we're going to talk about sneak attack. What I really want to see is what percentage of the deadly encounter sneak attack is taking out and see if that scales and keeps up as levels go on. At level 1, if you hit with a sneak attack, you'll deal on average 3.5 damage or 3.7 damage if you take critical hits into account. Right now, if you deal that damage every turn, you'll take out 20% of a deadly encounter. Now, this is not taking hit chance into account, but it's also not taking our weapon damage or modifiers into account as well. Our sneak attack scales up by 1d6 every odd level. So at level 3, we boost to 2d6, at 5, we boost to 3d6, and so on and so forth. Now, take a look at this table and see just how well this sneak attack scales in terms of monster HP. It is consistently taking out 20 to 22% of a deadly encounter. I have never run these numbers before, and I'm honestly really surprised at this. So then it makes me wonder, why do rogues feel less powerful at higher levels than at lower ones? And it's not just feel, DPR is hard to keep consistent. And the reason is because of that weapon damage and modifier. That adds a significant boost to our DPR at low levels. At high levels, we don't really increase that damage at all. If we added an extra 5 damage at level 1, that would boost our combat space from 20 to 48% of a deadly encounter. That's a huge jump. If we add 5 damage per round at level 20, it only boosts our combat space from 21 to 24. So, not very significant. And that's the reason for poor damage scaling, despite the fact that sneak attack feels just as powerful at all levels. One controversial thing that I dislike about sneak attack is that you can do it off of your turn. So it's a once per turn thing, meaning if you get a reaction attack on someone else's turn, you can also get a sneak attack. Wizards of the Coast tried to change it in one of the playtests to be only once per round, and a lot of people were very upset about it. The reason I dislike it is because there are ways to reliably get sneak attack off turn, and if your rogue can do that, they will do so much more damage than the next rogue. So I dislike the inequality that it brings between builds. But rogues are going to get some very interesting features later on that can combo really well with reaction attacks. So when they happen, they can feel really cool. Let's get to that a little bit later though. I want to move on to the new feature rogues get, which is Weapon Mastery. You get two options, and you can replace them when you take a long rest. The classic rogue combo is going to be Vex Weapon in one hand, 
and a Nick weapon in the other hand. Vex helps you generate advantage, so you can pull off sneak attack all by yourself. Nick lets you do an offhand weapon without using up your bonus action. It feels like it was tailor-made for rogues, to help them basically get an extra attack without giving them extra attack. Another really good option here is Whip. Whip is a finesse weapon, and now rogues are proficient with all finesse or light martial weapons. So that includes the Whip. Whip has the slow mastery, and it also has reach. That means a Whip rogue is probably a fantastic build. Then you can get close, Whip from safety, and then run away without even having to use your bonus action to disengage. Of course, this is not going to be people's go-to rogue, but it could be fun. I also want to note that hand crossbows have the Vex Mastery. That means you cannot dual wield hand crossbows without using your bonus action. Alright, and the last level 1 feature we get is Expertise. This gives you Expertise in 2 skills, and you get 2 more at level 6. Since rogues are the skill monkeys, it makes a lot of sense to be really good at certain things. Alright, at level 2, we get rogues' other most iconic feature, Cunning Action. This lets you use your bonus action to dash, disengage, or hide. It helps melee people skirmish so they can get in, hit, and get back out without taking any damage. It also lets ranged people hide and sneak around during combat. Rogues will make great use of this. And every build that wants to build a speedster to go super fast will also take two levels of rogue and make good use of this too. Okay, at level 3 we get Steady Aim. This was an optional feature in 2014, now it's core to the rogue. What it is, is you can take a bonus action to give yourself advantage on the next attack roll you're going to make this turn. The problem is, you can't have move before you do this, and you can't move after you do this either. So you're stuck where you are. Obviously, for melee people, that's going to be more of a problem. For ranged people, it's more possible to use. Probably melee characters will use cunning action, and ranged characters will use steady aim. Note that if you have two attacks, it's just as likely that you'll get sneak attack as if you have one attack with advantage. Okay, moving on to level 4 and our feat options. Now, rogues do get an extra feat at level 10, and that is always really beneficial. I just want to highlight a couple of the iconic rogue feats. One, dual wielder. This lets you have an extra extra attack with a bonus action. So if you can get in and out of the front lines, or you're comfortable sitting in the front lines, then dual wielder can give you a third attack, and that can be pretty good. Defensive Duelist is a good feat that lets us add our proficiency modifier to our AC against melee attacks for the entire round. Now, we are going to get Uncanny Dodge at the next level, and that will compete with our defensive use of this reaction. Let's compare those once we get Uncanny Dodge. Speedy. This is a renamed mobile feat. I don't know why they renamed it. I guess now technically you can take both of them. But it increases your speed, and now it gives disadvantage on any opportunity attacks against you. Hopefully you can avoid taking them all together, but it never hurts to have a disadvantage. We are going to have lots of ways to disable enemies, so they have disadvantage on their attacks anyway, so that might not be super useful. But an increase to speed is always helpful, especially when you're a skirmisher and need to get in and out really quick. Charger. This feels weird to say here because it feels like a strength feat, but actually it can boost dexterity. When you move 10 feet in and attack, then you can either add a d8 to the damage or push them 10 feet and either of those can be useful. Note that melee rogues are pretty much always going to be moving 10 feet before attacking anyway, if they're skirmishing. What you can do is run in, land that attack, and you can push them back 10 feet. Now you have a disengage for free. Then you can use your bonus action to do other things, or just extra damage is always helpful. Crossbow Expert, this can be a fantastic option for ranged builds, but also for melee builds. It lets you shoot your crossbow in melee range without disadvantage. So having a dagger and a hand crossbow on the other hand is actually a very solid build. It also lets you add your ability modifier to offhand attacks with your crossbow, and that is a fantastic gain. Poisoner. This lets you use a bonus action to poison your weapon before you attack with it, gives them the poison condition, and also deals some damage. The catch is it costs 50 gold per use of this. That means at low levels it's impossible to use, and at mid levels it's still expensive. Also, rogues do get an ability next level where you can poison enemies already. So, it seems like Poisoner and Rogue are like this match made in heaven, but in reality it has bonus action conflict and it has poison condition conflict as well. So it might not actually be the greatest choice. Fighting Initiate, this is from 2014, so it doesn't give you an ability score bonus, but it lets you choose a fighting style and that can be very helpful. Something like two weapon fighting or dueling can be a great option to boost your damage. Magic Initiate. This is an origin feat, 
and it gives you a free cantrip. We can choose True Strike or even something like Booming Blade. Both of these can be great boosts to our damage as a rogue, but personally, it doesn't feel like a standard rogue, unless you're an arcane trickster. But overall, the damage can be good and scale well. One more possible option is the Piercer feat. This is the worst feat of the three damage type feats. Slasher, Crusher, Piercer, but it's still something. All right, let's move on to level five and take a look at Uncanny Dodge. This is a reaction when somebody hits you with an attack, you can half that damage. It doesn't have to be a melee attack, it doesn't have to be a weapon attack either, so you can use it on spells. One problem here is that monsters get more and more attacks as we increase in difficulty. So if a monster has one attack and we half that damage, it's fantastic. If a monster has four attacks and we only half the damage from one of them, it's obviously not as good. Take a look at this table here where I have sample monsters from across the level curve. At level 5, a fire elemental has two attacks. It deals 10 damage on a hit. If we take its hit chance into account, then the average damage we get is 11 damage. If we use our reaction to uncanny dodge, we can prevent 5 of that damage. So that's about 50% of the damage. At level 9, we have a Glabrezu, or Glabrezu, how do you pronounce that? Anyway, their attacks deal 16 damage on a hit, and they have 4 attacks. That means an average damage of 30. If we use Uncanny Dodge, we can prevent 8 of that damage. So that's something, but it's a much lower percentage of the damage than it was for the Fire Elemental. At level 13, we can have an Adult White Dragon that attacks 3 times, at level 17, a Death Knight that attacks 3 times as well. And the damage that we prevent is actually becoming a lower, lower percentage of what that monster is actually dealing. Now, let's take a look at Defensive Duelist. If we just have this enemy attacking us and we use our reaction to boost our AC by our proficiency modifier, then we will take this damage instead. And we see here, this is how much damage we prevent by using Defensive Duelist. And the damage reduction is actually pretty similar to Uncanny Dodge up to level 13. Defensive Duelist gets stronger as we level up because our proficiency bonus goes up, so we're more likely to prevent hits. Overall, I think you could have Uncanny Dodge and Defensive Duelist on the same character and use them in different circumstances, but I can definitely see there being enough of a conflict that you won't want both of them. The next feature we get at level 5 is a brand new one that I'm really excited about. It's called Cunning Strike. When you hit with your sneak attack, you can remove some of that sneak attack damage and instead add in a new effect. We will get more effects later, but right now we can poison an enemy, trip them, or we can withdraw. Poison gives the enemy the poison condition, and they have it for one minute until they save from it. The poison condition gives you disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks, and that can be quite helpful, especially if you can do it every round. Trip, they make a deck save, or they fall prone. Now, monsters typically have poor deck saves, so this can be a very reliable way to knock people prone. Knocking people prone can be a very powerful control, and it can really limit an enemy's movement. Also, if you knock them prone, they'll have disadvantage on their attacks against you, so if you walk away, you're less likely to get hit by that OA. Then, on their turn, they have to waste half their movement to stand up, so they're less likely to chase after you. The last one is Withdraw, and this lets you move up to half your speed without provoking opportunity attacks. So actually, you can get in, attack a couple times, and then withdraw without even using your bonus action. Then you can get out, use your bonus action to hide, or do some other thing. Now, one thing that I'm not certain about is how this interacts with critical hits. Let me know in the comments if you know if there's been some clarification on this. But when we critically hit, we double the amount of dice we roll, so our sneak attack doubles. Do we remove our Cunning Strike sneak attack dice before we double the dice, or after we double the dice when we crit? I really hope it's after, because otherwise it would be really punishing to use our Cunning Strike when we critically hit. Okay, now I want to take a look at each of these Cunning Strike options, and I want to see how much control they do. So, those who haven't seen my videos, I have a weird way of measuring control. What I do is I take the unconscious condition, give it a value of 100, and then each part of the unconscious condition is assigned a value out of 100. When we do that one effect, we will do that much control. So doing a control per round of 100 is the equivalent of knocking one person unconscious per round. So I want to take a look at how much control we can get for each of these options. So here we are with poison. At level 5, we have a 55% chance that an enemy will fail this constitution saving throw. So on average, this poison condition will last for 1.2 rounds. So if we take that and multiply it by the control we get from the poisoned condition, which is 
15, we end up with a control per round of 18. As we increase in levels, monsters become more and more likely to make that poison save, and so our control per round decreases. But giving up 3.5 damage to get 18 control is pretty good. Now we can take that control and divide it by the damage we lost to see how much control we gained per damage point we've lost. So at level 1 it's 5.2. It's not important to control calculations, I just thought it might be interesting to see. I should mention that 28% of creatures are immune to the poison condition, so that makes it significantly less reliable. For trip, monsters have a higher chance of failing this, so our control per round is going to be 18 here, and that's actually exactly what it is for the poison option. As we increase in levels, we're actually more likely to trip them than before. For withdraw, we move half our speed, that is a control of 6. So it's a lot less, but it's for sure going to work. And this is an option that you can actually build your character around. At level 14, we'll get more options for our Cunning Strike, and we'll take a look at how much control we gain on those too. At level 7, we get Evasion, and this is a fantastic defensive ability. What it does is when you take damage from a deck saving throw, if you succeed, you take no damage, even if you were supposed to take half damage. If you fail, you only take half damage. Rogues have very high dex and proficiency in deck saving throws, so their dex is already super high. You are very likely to take no damage at all from deck saving throws, and a lot of damage actually comes in through deck saving throws. Things like fire breaths, or fireball, or lightning bolt, a lot of these things rely on your deck saving throw, or you take that damage. To see just how impactful evasion is, I have averaged out monsters damages and split that between damage that goes to AC, con saves, and deck saves. And about 10 to 20% of the damage that monsters deal come through deck saves. Let's take a look at some numbers here. At level 7 when we get this, we already have a high deck save. If we don't take evasion into account, we are saving on most of those. So we'll only take about 4.3 damage per round if the entire encounter is focused fire on us. With evasion, we only take 1 damage per round though. And yeah, that's not a huge amount of damage prevented right now, but as we keep going, it can reduce the damage we get per round by up to 20 damage per round at level 20. And that is really significant. We get one more feature at level 7 which is Reliable Talent. This is the same as in 2014, but it's been moved from level 10 to level 7. If you make a skill check or a tool check and you're proficient in it, any roll 9 or lower becomes a 10. Again, rogues are the skill monkeys, so they almost never fail at the things they're good at. Take a look at this table, with and without reliable talent. If we take the average roll, it doesn't actually boost it by too much, but our minimum score is boosted by a lot. At level 11, we get improved cutting strike. This lets us choose two options for our cutting strike. That means we can trip and poison, or trip and withdraw, or whatever combination we want. We do, however, have to remove one sneak attack dice per use of this. So if we use two, we would remove 2d6 right now. Honestly, it's not a bad exchange. I think I'd probably use two options every turn. All right, moving on to level 14. Now we get Devious Strikes. This is our upgrade to Cunning Strike. We get three new fantastic control options. First one is Daze. This costs 2d6, and when an enemy is affected by it, they either have to take an action, a move, or a bonus action. They only get one of these. That means if a monster can't reach anybody, and they have to move to attack, they have therefore forfeited their attack action. And that is really strong. Of course, if they already have someone to attack within range, then it doesn't do very much at all to them. So it's situational, or you have to be very tactical in how you use it. It's very similar to Tasha's Mind Whip, which is generally considered a very powerful spell across the entire level curve. You could also pair this with the trip option. So now they are prone and they have to choose between standing up or attacking while staying prone. That is a tough choice to force them to make. Also, imagine getting an opportunity attack and you daze them as they pass you. Now they're dazed and they've already committed to using their movement, so they can't use their action, I guess. I'm not 100% sure, but it sounds powerful. The next one is a biggie. This is Knockout. It costs a whopping 6d6 to activate. They make a con save, and if they fail, they are knocked unconscious. Save ends. Or if they take damage, they wake up too. But the fact that it can last multiple rounds feels really cool. Use it at the start of combat, 
on an enemy that doesn't have a high constitution and you could make a big impact into the battle, especially if you target something like a caster. Of course, death is a better control option than unconscious. So if you're taking out that much damage and it could have killed them, that's obviously a better option. I think knockout is good for when you first start your combat and you can remove somebody for a turn. But overall, this is a high risk, high reward option. Feels like it fits in because rogues are kind of the gamblers. And the last option we get is obscure. It costs 3d6, they make a deck save, or they are blinded for a turn. Blinded is a great condition. It gives them disadvantage on their attacks, it gives advantage on any incoming attacks to them, and they have no line of sight. That totally disables casters because almost all spells require a line of sight. Alright, now let's take a look at these numbers and see how much control we gain from them. Daze is a con save, so this is our chance of the enemy failing. If we assume there's a 50% chance of them losing their action, then our control is 12.5 at level 14. Now that might not seem so high, but if we use it correctly and disable their action, that turns into a 19 control per round. So be wise in how you do this. It can be paired in so many cool ways. I think Daze is going to be one of those solid options that are consistently used by every rogue. For Knockout is also a con save and this is our chance of them failing. Every turn they're going to reroll the save, and I'm going to say there's a 25% chance to take any damage at all and the condition is removed. If we average it out over 4 turns, the control we do is 74, and that is very high. Unfortunately, I don't think this one's going to see a lot of action, because giving up 21 damage to do that feels like it might be too high of a cost. But it could be a good option for a crit, then it feels like we can remove those dice and get a knockout for free. Alright, the last one is Obscure. This is a deck save, so the chances of succeeding are pretty high. The control we get from it is pretty decent, and right now that gives us a control of 22.4. So those are all of our Cunning Strike options. If you're interested in seeing the highest amount of control for the least amount of damage lost, it actually goes to prone. Our trip option is very reliable, and it costs very little. So it seems like just about every marshal is going to be knocking people prone now. Yeah, maybe they should have added a feat where you can ignore prone when attacking people from ranged. Feels like ranged characters are going to get disadvantaged on their attacks a lot. Alright, let's move on to level 15. Here we get Slippery Mind, it gives us proficiency in wisdom and charisma saves. It used to just be wisdom in 2014, so it's great to have an extra one too. It'll boost our chance of succeeding on those debilitating effects by 25%. At level 18, we get Elusive, and this means that nobody can get advantage on their attacks against us even if they're invisible or hiding or whatever else they've got, as long as we're not incapacitated. It's hard to say how frequently this will come up, I imagine pretty often though, so this is never bad. At level 19 we get an epic boon, and the one suggested for us here is Boon of Night Spirit. This is a pretty interesting one. If you're in dim light or darkness, you can use a bonus action to turn yourself invisible. Your invisibility ends as soon as you take an action, a bonus action, or a reaction. But otherwise, you can actually hang out being invisible all day long. You don't lose the invisible condition when you leave Dim Light or Darkness. So as soon as combat's over, you walk into a shadow and turn invisible until the next fight. And you can also be invisible all night long. So out of combat, you're basically the invisible man. If you do stay in Dim Light or Darkness, you have resistance to all damage except Psychic and Radiant though. All in all, this is obviously going to depend on what your setting is. If you're in the Underdark, you can use this all the time. Instead of disengaging with the bonus action, you can just turn invisible, and that's pretty great. Although I imagine probably a lot of them have blindsight. I couldn't help but think this would be really fun to pair with the sentinel feat. You go invisible, stand right beside the enemy, when they attack somebody else, you get an opportunity attack and slam them, and you can even knock them unconscious when you hit them. Sounds like a lot of fun. Even if you're in dim light or darkness 25% of the time, that's going to be really significant in those encounters. Taking half damage from everything, and you can uncanny dodge and reduce that in half again. The final feature you get at Rogue 20 is Stroke of Luck. When you fail a d20 test, that's an attack roll, saving throw, or ability check, you can turn that into a 20 instead. That means if it's an attack, it turns into a critical hit. In 2014, we also had the Stroke of Luck feature, but it lets you turn a miss into a hit, not a crit. I don't need to tell you that a critical hit for a rogue is very good. That turns your 10d6 into 20d6. Now, the most important time to get a crit will be in the first rounds of battle. So one stupid way you could do it is instead of attacking with your dexterity, you could attack with your strength. 
and usually your strength's gonna be pretty low, so your attack bonus goes way down. Then, because you're likely to miss, you can turn it into an auto crit, and then that first round, you're pretty much guaranteed to get that crit. Obviously, that's gonna be a weird way to do it. Probably more likely, what you'll do is you'll just delay activating your sneak attack until the last possible attack. So let's say you have two attacks. You attack the first time, if you hit, you don't do sneak attack. Attack the second time, if you hit, you do do sneak attack, and just try to miss the next time. If you miss the second time, you just turn into an auto crit. All in all though, this can add a huge amount of damage to a battle. If you have a turn where you weren't going to sneak attack, but Stroke of Luck turns it into an auto crit, that'll do around 82 damage. Even if you divided that up over 4 turns, that's 20 damage per round. Now, if you were already going to sneak attack, it only adds about 47 damage, because you're only getting the crit damage. So the amount of damage you get from Stroke of Luck is going to vary, depending on how likely you are to hit at all. Even in the worst circumstances, we're adding 10 damage per round from this feature. If we compare that to like Barbarian, they're adding about 6 damage per round from their feature, and it's considered a pretty good one. I think this one's pretty good, and you can use it on saving throws and ability checks too, to save for those vital moments. It doesn't necessarily have to be an attack. All right, now that we've talked about all the features, what I do next is I look at a typical build for a rogue, and we're then gonna place it in a tier. See how much damage it does, control it does, durability, and resistance. Now, before we do that, I wanna take a backwards glance at the ranger build I did. Some people have pointed out in the comments that it's unfair that the ranger didn't use any of their spells at all. And I agree. I also realized that I messed up calculating some of the control they did. So let me fix that here and I'll show you what it looks like. The build originally used Hunter's Mark and every bonus action was dedicated to Hunter's Mark. I think it's fair to say we can use two of those bonus actions to instead do something like Hail of Thorns. So that's what I'm going to do. We'll upcast Hail of Thorns to the highest spell slot we've got and we'll do that twice per battle. If we do that, the damage becomes significantly better. And if we add in the subclass damage, because every ranger subclass adds damage, then the damage becomes quite respectable. Also, the control is better because I forgot turning in Viz adds to the control, and I totally forgot to add their boon of dimension travel into our control, because teleporting gives control. So here is the new damage compared to what I had posted. Now, let's move on to the rogue. I believe the typical rogue build is going to be a dual wielder. So two knives or a short sword and a scimitar. Of course, having a ranged crossbow rogue is also pretty iconic. So you do have true strike builds, but I don't believe that's gonna be the typical rogue. So for us, we're gonna go short sword and a scimitar, and we're gonna take the Vex and the Nick property, and we're gonna do that. When we hit level two, we'll use our cunning action every turn to disengage. So we can run in, attack, attack, bonus action, disengage, and run back out. At level four, we'll take the charger feet. Since we're running in and out each turn, we may as well take advantage of that. That'll boost our dex to an 18. Once we get Cunning Strike, we are going to use it all the time. I will show you the damage if you were to not use it as well, but for these ones, I'm going to use it all the time. And I think you should. It's a critical rogue feature. In fact, let's take a look at the damage right now, with and without. So right now at level 5, we have a DPR of 21.4, and that turns into 41% of a deadly encounter. If we use Cunning Strike and take out a d6 from our sneak attack, it turns into 18.3, and that's 35% of a deadly encounter. It's not an awful combat space, but we are gaining a lot of control. Okay, as we go up at level 8, we're going to take Defensive Duelist. I've already talked about this before, but for our numbers, because I'm assuming every enemy is attacking us, it's going to make our defenses much better. At level 10, we'll take Speedy, and now our dex is maxed out, and we have a higher move speed so we can get in and out and skirmish better. At level 11, we can use two Cunning Strike options, and I will use that every turn as well. At level 12, for our feet, I'm going to take the two weapon fighting Fighter Initiate feat. So now on our offhand attack, our Nick weapon, we can add our ability score as well. Then once we get Devious Strikes at 14, I'm going to assume we do Daze and Trip. Also, don't forget we have Charger, so we could actually hit them, push them back 10 feet, knock them prone, and daze them. That feels pretty crazy. At level 16, we'll boost our con. At level 19, we'll take that epic boon of the Night Spirit. So let's take a look at our damage overall. We start out doing a lot of damage. A rogue is going to feel most powerful at level 1. You're taking out 61% of an encounter by yourself. As we keep going, 
that's going to decrease down and down and down and we see that it goes to 30 percent of a deadly encounter so despite all the feats we've taken to boost our damage we end up feeling less and less powerful over time on average it turns into about 38 percent of a deadly encounter across the career this is without using cunning strike with using cunning strike we can see it drops down quite a bit and we end up dipping to about 24 percent combat space now, if you have a party of four, 25% is average. So it's not terrible damage, but it's definitely not main damage dealer damage. Let's compare the 2024 damage to the 2014 rogue's damage. We can see that at low levels, the 2024 rogue is doing significantly more damage. That's because of Nick. So we can do two weapon fighting while still having our bonus action available. In our 2014 build, I took the mobile feat, which lets us disengage for free. So at level 10, when I took that, we can see the damage gets very close. The red line here is using Cunning Strike. And at level 10, the Cunning Strike build starts doing less damage than the 2014 Rogue. But overall, if we manage to get two attacks with our 2014 Rogue, our combat space is pretty smooth through all levels. If we don't get mobile and pick up that second attack, the damage gets lower and lower and lower until it's pretty poor. Damage-wise, Rogues in Tier 1 and 2 will feel more powerful than in 2014, but at later levels, it'll be pretty close. Of course, if you're using Cunning Strike, it is slightly worse, but all three of them are close. Control, on the other hand, hopefully will be significantly better. Let's take a look. I assume we're Cunning Action every turn, so that's going to give us some extra movement. With our Cunning Action, Trip, Poison, Daze, and then the Speedy Feet we take, we end up with decent control. We go all the way up to about 46 and a half control per round. We could go much higher if we did knockout instead, but that would reduce our damage quite a bit. Overall, if we were to average out our control over the entire career, we end up with 31.4 control per round. For Marshall, that's quite good. Compare this to the 2014 Rogue, you're doing about 13 control per round. In terms of durability, we have quite a few defensive features actually. We have evasion, and that reduces our dex damage we take by a lot. We also have defensive duelist, and that helps us reduce our AC damage quite a bit. Then we get boon of the night spirit, and that can give us resistance to all damage. This is what our durability looks like. It actually goes up over time. We become more and more durable. We end up lasting around 1.8 rounds of an entire deadly encounter focused fire on us. That is actually decently tanky. Now let's compare that durability to 2014. Here's a graph. We can see that right away we start with significantly more survivability, and that is just due to the tough feat. But as we continue on, eventually the 2014 Rogue picks up the tough feat as well, and they end with the same amount of HP. But the 2024 Rogue is significantly more durable, even at that point. And that's due partially to the defensive duelist feat, which bumps our numbers here because we're assuming all enemies are attacking us. So it might be somewhat inflated compared to Uncanny Dodge. The thing we're not taking into account here is potential disadvantage on enemy attacks. We can trip them and poison them, and that would make us a lot more durable there too. Pair that with our boosted AC from Defensive Duelist makes a really great combination. But overall, at later levels, the Rogue is looking pretty durable. Now, in terms of mental resistance, what we do is we take three Wisdom saving throws, and we see how likely you are to succeed at every single one of them, and then we average them out. For rogues, we have less and less of a chance of succeeding a wisdom saving throw until we hit Slippery Mind at 15. And then we get jumped back up, and we can stay about 45% chance to succeed. Note that I did use our Stroke of Luck on the attack rolls instead of a saving throw. We could use that on a saving throw here, but I put it into our damage instead. So our overall resistance is 36%. So if we slot the rogue into our tier lists, this is where we land. It's currently the lowest damage dealer, second highest durability, highest control, and second highest resistance. I think that about fits. I am surprised at the durability. I thought it would be lower, but they definitely, out of the marshals we've seen so far, have the best control. It's unfortunate that they have to sacrifice their damage to get it, Unlike the Barbarian, where they get really cool control options and that actually boosts their damage too. I don't think the Cunning Strike options should be free, but maybe if they gave more sneak attack dice, it would make it feel less painful. Well, thanks for watching the Rogue video. I'm going to put a survey out for the last two non-casters. 
Monk, and Paladin. We'll see what people want next. Thanks for joining me, and I hope to see you next time.